10 to 15 nanometer wavelength differences. So here you can see if you know the characteristics of these different uh, crops and how we associate it, uh, these things with the chemical characteristics or the reflectance pattern, we will be able to identify or distinguish the different types of crops as well as different features like dry soil, wet soil, water, etc. in case of different areas. Similarly, here also we can see how they vary. There are variations with respect to the magnitude as well as the how the reflectance pattern goes with respect to this. So how the hyperspectral, the first image shows the hyperspectral uh, spectra generated from an every MG data and the second corresponds to a multispectral spectrum. So in this, the multispectral data, the uh, reflectance patterns, they are very smooth. We can't, uh, they are very smooth lines. Whereas in case of hyperspectral data, we can see there are certain uh, absorption peaks as well as absorption troughs occurring in the particular area. Thus, in short, we can say that the hyperspectral data, it can improve the accuracy in uh, quantitative estimation of various chemical compounds in various plants as well as soils. Coming to the specific applications of hyperspectral remote sensing, especially with respect to crop as well as soil studies, I think you might have been uh, you might have been seeing this for the n number of times since few people are associated with remote sensing. So this is basically the spectral reflectance curve of a healthy vegetation. Here you can see the different wavelength regions that is starting from 0.4 to 0.7, then from 0.4 to uh, 0.7 till 1.5, then 1.5 to 2, and then till 2.5. There are specific features and the role played by various constituents present in the plants. So from 0.4, that means 400 to 700 nanometers, we can see the main absorption features are mainly because of the presence of chlorophyll and other associated plaque pigments, which causes this green peak. That's why we can see the vegetation in the form of green because the human eye can perceive only in the visible reflectance in the visible wavelength. Range. Then we have a red edge. This is the high wavelength region in the MAI region. Here also we have small, uh, two yes, small. Sir. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yes, sorry to listen to this speciality. Uh, yeah. So, these slides are not moving, sir. So, can you just reload it once again? Okay, ma'am. Is it moving now, ma'am? Uh, no, sir. Could you just please uh, close and uh, reshare it once again, sir? Yes, sir. Same. Now we are able uh, to see. Yes. Yeah. So shall I proceed uh, without the full screen mode? But I think the issue yeah. comes when we go to the full screen. Mode. I will just check with that. Is it changing sure, now right now? Yes, sir. The slides are it's changing now. Changing in the full screen mode, right? It's Is still it showing now? in the same uh, presentation mode. Yeah, but it's me. It's changing in my system. So shall I proceed without the full screen mode? Is it visible yes, for sir. everyone? Yes, yes, it is visible, yeah. sir. Okay, right. So in this, uh, but there are certain animations in here, I'll just uh, change between both. So in this, we can see the, it's mainly because of the chlorophyll absorption bands. Then we have certain atmospheric absor water absorption bands. You can see the one around 1.4 and 1.9. They are very prominent water absorption bands. And we don't have much data at those particular wavelength range, whether it is a terrestrial remote sensing or an aerial or a spatial or a space bond remote sensing. Then we have a wavelength range around 2.2 uh, nanometers or 2.2 micrometers or 2.2 nanometers or 2000 nanometers, uh, mainly because of the clay content. That we will be coming to later. And coming to this particular second graph, we can see the distinction between the different features we commonly observe on the air surface. That is how the vegetation reflections curve varies. Then we have a dry soil, which is in the orange color. And then we have a wet soil, which is a dark brown color. So the, the same soil, when it is having, uh, when the, only the variation 
is with respect to the moisture content we have we can see the magnitude of reflectance is getting drastically reduced then here we have the clear lake water as well as the turbid water so the other issue with respect to use of remote sensing especially the multispectral remote sensing is that the soil reflectance mainly from the soil field or a particular bare area it has got hardly any peak and drop thus limiting the use of multispectral remote sensing especially for soil studies so the hyperspectral remote sensing uh, plays a key role uh, in overcoming this particular difficulty by discriminating the minute variations in the soil composition and thus aiding us in the quantification of different parameters the next slide is visible ma'am hello so coming to the different factors which affect the crop reflectance uh, we will just uh, briefly describe about them these are main factors which affect the reflectance of the crop be it any crop or any type of vegetation whether it is a broadleaf or another thing the main thing is the pigments the pigments mainly consist of the chlorophylls the carotenoids as well as the anthocyanins then the nutrients as well as the water content also play an important role then there are other biochemical uh, components like the cellulose lignin etc then various uh, plant biophysical parameters like the leaf area index and canopy cover then the species as well as the composition then the biomass net primary productivity the fraction of the photosynthetically active radiation biotic as well as abiotic stress these are some of the major components or the factors which affect the crop reflectance so with respect to uh, the various major plant pigments we can just see the absorption spectra this is not a reflection spectra remember it is an absorption spectra here the highest value means at this particular wavelength the absorption due to this particular pigment is maximum so the first thing that is the chlorophyll a you can see the peak it is something between 400 and 450 and if you see the chlorophyll b you can see it is slightly at a higher wavelength range somewhat around 450 so because of the combination of both chlorophyll a and chlorophyll b the green uh, vegetation they have a good amount of absorption in the blue wavelength range that is between 400 and 500 nanometers similarly here you can see a small here you can see a small peak around the uh, beyond 600 between 600 and 6, uh, 650 and 700 this is also the mainly because of the absorption in the red wavelength range so here you can see wherever there is a less amount of absorption that means it is obviously we will be having a good amount of reflectance in those particular wavelength range and this is the reason why majority of the vegetation appears as green to us for our naked eyes Similarly, this is the spectral reflectance of areas of dry uh, plant constituents, mainly the cellulose, the lignin, the pectin. You can see the absorption features and the magnitude, all those things are varying with respect to different wavelength regions. So depending on the predominance of cellulose or lignin or pectin, the absorption characteristics as well as the re resultant reflectance uh, may vary from plant to plant or the dry matter or the uh, biome, fresh biomass. Yeah, one minute. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kista. Yeah, uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, coming to the different uh, factors which affect the soil reflectance, the major factors which affect the soil reflectance are the particle size, which is mainly the textural composition, which is the relative proportion of sand, silt, and clay particles. Then comes the soil moisture, then comes the organic matter amount, the iron oxides, the mineral composition, the surface roughness, as well as the soil salinity. Coming to the particle size of the texture, uh, I hope many of you people might have visited a sea beach. The sand, it appears very uh, white, 
when it is dry, you will have a good amount of reflectance. But in true sense, with increase in the particle size, basically the reflectance is getting decreased. If we are having a very pure and a dry clay, in this particular image, you can see the highest reflectance is shown by this green band, the, this green graph, this is basically indicating the clay cut. So if the, if the particle is very pure, then the finer the particle size, the higher will be the reflectance. That means the clay particles will have the higher reflectance, then the uh, silt, then the sand will have the lowest reflectance. But the issue is with respect to in case of in nature, we don't have much uh, things which are in very pure state. In nature, the sand, silt and clay, the soil particles, they are mainly mixed with many other impurities other, as well as various coloring agents, as well as various components like the organic matter, then the moisture content. So when these things uh, have, then when these things are increasing in the soil, then the trend reverses. Then coming to the impact of soil moisture, here you can see this is the this graph shows the spectral reflectance behavior of a same soil sample, but the only variation is with respect to the moisture content. The, the, the topmost one contains only one percentage moisture, and the second one contains five percentage, the ten percentage, fifteen, and the lowest one contains twenty percentage. So the take-home message is that even if the sample is same, with increase in the soil moisture content, the uh, reflectance drastically reduces. Uh, not only the drastic reduction in uh, overall reflectance, you can see there is certain structure which is getting enlarged or here we can see this particular dip is not at all, it is not at all visible, but it is getting predominant as the increase in soil mass. So this is mainly corresponding to the water absorption bands around uh, 1400 nanometers as well as the 1900 nanometers. Then coming to the uh, contribution of organic matter. This uh, this shows the spectral reflectance behavior of different mixtures, the sand versus uh, organic, matter, uh, organic matter mixture. The topmost one indicates it's the spectral reflectance behavior of a uh, material which contains 100% sand. And further graphs, they mainly show the organic matter content is increasing with a reduction, totally is 100%. Here it has 25% organic and 75% sand. And the last one is 100% organic. So that means with increasing the organic matter content, the overall reflectance of the particular soil gets drastically reduced. This is one of the reasons where the organic matter rich soils, they appear dark in the field as well as in the nature. Another thing is that with increase in the organic matter content, you can see there is a small curvature at this particular region. This is also an impact of organic matter because of the increased absorption in the visible to uh, early stages of uh, NIR wavelength. Another important thing which affects the soil reflectance is the presence or absence of iron oxides or various other coloring components. Uh, many of you people might be knowing that uh, iron oxide mainly imparts red or bright red, bright yellow, orange uh, shades to the soil. And here you can see if there is an increase in the uh, organic matter, uh, sorry, the iron oxide content, there will be an increase in the reflectance in the wavelength. Similarly, another important thing which uh, affects the soil uh, reflectance is something known as the mineral composition, which is the predominant clay mineral present in the particular soil. Because the presence of these clay minerals alter various physical as well as the chemical properties of the soil. And the most important thing is that it affects the water holding capacity, thus affecting the soil overall soil. Reflectance. There are n number of uh, uh, minerals like the calcite, which is the pure calcium carbonate or the normal chalk, blackboard chalk we use. Then we have the carbonate, which is basically known as the China clay. We can see there are specific absorption features at specific wavelength locations. So once we see a spectra like this and the wavelength, we match with the wavelength location it is uh, occurring or appearing, then we can uh, say that it contains sufficient amount of carbonate or based on the different feature, this particular feature around 1.9, it is characteristics of this particular thing which is known as the Mount Morlonitic clay or it is a twist one type of clay mineral which is widely used in cosmetic products also like in the form of multani and And another important thing is the soil salinity. The soil salinity also uh, having important influence on the reflectance of the soil because with increase in the salt content, the reflectance of the soil, this is why the Mainly the salt affected regions, they appear whitish in case of white with appearing very bright tones in case of phosphor composites of uh, saturated remote sensing data or uh, airborne data. 
So with this small introduction about the various aspects or effects, effect of constraints on uh, uh, the reflectance behavior of plant as well as the soils. The hyperspectral remote sensing applications, especially for crop as well as the soil studies, it can be broadly classified into these two in these three different categories. With respect to the soil related studies, it mainly has been widely used for the characterization as well as the mapping of the soil uh, different mapping units. Then for the parameter estimation with respect to various nutrients as well as the heavy metals pollution. Then soil fertility as well as the quality monitoring with respect to physical as well as chemical and biological properties. And coming to the crop related studies where hyperspectral plays a very important role, it has been very widely used for the crop discrimination as well as the characterization. Not only the crop discrimination, even two people have been using this for uh, differentiation between two different varieties of the same crop also. And characterization is with respect to the growth behavior, the land area, uh, how the crop growth, the conditioning and other things. Then comes the biophysical parameter retrieval, which is mainly widely used for the radiative transfer modeling approaches as well as the crop yield prediction models. Then it has also been used for the abiotic stress monitoring with respect to various crops, but with respect to the uh, impact of drought, uh, it can be abiotic stress can be either the high amount of moisture mainly because of the flooding or it can be because of the drought. Then the impact of salinity on the crop growth as well as the performance as well as the yield uh, scenario. Then comes the nutrient stress, how the nutrient stress also affects the crop growth as well as the productivity. It has also been widely employed for studying the biotic stress monitoring also, how the impact of various pest and diseases are affected. Sir, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Yeah, this is Dr. Roshan. Your slide is uh, not moving and we only see one okay. slide. Factors affecting. Yeah, now it's moving. Yeah, okay. Okay, then I will continue without any uh, full screen mode. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this is slide we were uh, discussing now. So the crop related studies, it can be uh, mainly the biotech stress monitoring. It is mainly related to the studying the impact of various pest and diseases which are commonly prevalent in certain agroecological systems, uh, how they are impacting the crop growth as well as the yield monitoring. So all these soil related studies as well as the crop related studies, they have been achieved using certain approaches which mainly the ma major approaches which are widely used for hyperspectral remote sensing data processing and further analysis, they mainly include the use of various spectral indices, spectral matching or unmixing, then the spectral feature fitting as well as the continuum removal, then various empirical or the regression modeling, physical or the process-based modeling, as well as the spectral shift and the retrograde. So these approaches might have been uh, covered by the faculty in the, during the yesterday some of the lectures, so we will not be discussing in detail, but we will be just discussing about how these things have been applied for various applications. One of the in-house studies conducted in our uh, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, we have classified, uh, we have used the every century uh, data. Every century data was used for the specific uh, crop and soil discrimination using an every century hyperspectral data. So first of all, the idea was to we have the same crop cultivated at different locations within the study area. So how to have a single uh, spectral library for the identifying the different crops with uh, high accuracy. So for that, a spectral similarity analysis was done between the pure ground spectra, pure ground spectra and the Ebris NG spectra for different classes. That means the various crops as well as the soil types. And this uh, table shows the various similarity scores we were able to uh, obtain. So the, the similarity between the spectra from the airborne data and the ground collected data was found to be highest in case of identifying the particular crop, which is the Joa, then the identification of chili crop, then the forest, then the tomato, the cotton, the red gram, and so on. These are the similarity scores. The higher the similarity score, there is a high similarity between the ground collected data and the airborne or the space bound collected data. And based on these uh, precise spectral libraries, these specific precise spectral libraries, they were generated by a uh, combination of technique known as the SIPS and that is the spectral information divergence combined with a spectral angle mapper technique. So this is by this is mainly used for combining the spectra of a same crop or a same land use land cover, which is spread throughout the bigger area. So which uh, so there should be one uh, final spectra we should get for classifying all these things. So it was for generating this precise spectral library. So the 
precise spectral library by the SIPSAN method. It was used for classification and identification of various uh, crop as well as the soil types. And the technique used was a segmentation based support vector machine with a linear uh, kernel classifier. I hope you are able to see the uh, uh, output cl classified outputs. Here you can see. Here you can see the input uh, image. It was used with uh, the different classes like the red soil, the black soil, the Bengal gram, cotton, either. So and how? And this is the classified image using an object-based classification. You can see the black uh, soil. The cotton crop was found to be excellently classified and identified among the various crops present in the particular area. And in this, you can see the uh, black soil. The attempt was to distinguish between two different types of soils, that is the black soil and the red soil, which have contrasting uh, genesis as well as the contrasting characteristics in the area. And the crop selection is also based on the crop type, uh, soil type only. So the black soil, the mixed soil and the red soil, they were able to identify classify with around 70 to 80 percentage accuracy in the particular area. And people have even used for the crop discrimination using hyperspectral imaging. Uh, in another study, uh, as part of the every Energy campaign, uh, the people uh, from the space application center Ramadapa, they have within a very small patch. This is a university farm of a particular very small area. Here you can see a very diverse variety of crops have already been cultivated in this particular area, like the chickpea, coriander, late wheat, uh, menthol, mustard, peas, and even wheat have been cultivated in this particular area for a long period of time. So they try to use crop classification with the aim to identify between these very closely appearing these many of these crops the, uh, even with the naked eye from a distance we will not be able to differentiate between them so the crop classification was attempted using the different algorithms or homogeneous as well as the heterogeneous agriculture and horticulture crop areas for undertaken and uh, from the study area they have identified certain sensitive band regions uh, which can be used for crop discrimination and certain sensitive band regions, mainly for crop as well as soil health, was also identified by the uh, workers. So, for this particular study area, the overall classification accuracy with respect to these different types of diverse characteristics crops, they were able to obtain an overall accuracy of 86 percentage and a perfect upper condition of 0.8. So the different algorithms they were also tested. They were also tested the spectral angle mapper and the maximum likelihood algorithm. They showed classification accuracies ranging from 77 to 94 percentage with respect to different classes. With respect to different classes, in case of an every century data, whereas the similar uh, classification done using a DISPO data, the accuracy is only up to 55 percentage. Here also you can see the uh, different types of crops like the sugar cane. Wheat, banana, onion, other, all these things were, uh, they, were uh, they were able to distinguishly map between these different crop types. And these are the uh, spectral behavior obtained from the field as well as the every classified data. So the crop type classification and the spectral behavior of every SMG and the in-situ data, which revealed that the, only the curvature or the magnitude varies of uh, between the two different spectra, but the shape as well as the uh, a slope and other features they remain very very close to each other and another attempt using a customized deep neural network and an mnf based classification scheme they were able to map different agricultural and horticultural crops with considerably higher accuracies uh, reaching up to 85 percent because we are classifying between very closely and even the uh, crop stages also whether the tobacco crop whether it is in uh, vegetative stage or it is in a peak vegetative stage or it is in a flowering stage such sort of discrimination was also attempted and getting an accuracy of 85 percentage for such sort of fine level uh, level 3 or level 4 sort of classification is something which is very uh, advantageous for a position farming point of view here also we can see the different types of crops even uh, distinguishing between mango and sapota crop and here also here we can see the reference and the classified uh, spectra belonging to the reference as well as the classified images. So you can see they are very quite similar. And this is another study mainly with us, not only with the annual crop, but mainly widely for the perennial crop also, mainly the orchard crop is using uh, high, high resolution or the hyperspectral data. 
so the, the they have pre processed the ground reference spectral data and they have identified the significant wave bands for discrimination using an anova analysis that is the analysis of variance analysis then they have computed a spectral separability between the different pair of fruit crops using a jm distance technique and out of the total around uh, 2000 wave, uh, wave numbers of the wave bands they have identified certain selected wave bands using an lda analysis that is the linear discriminant analysis and out of the total number of bands, around 10 optimum spectral bands were identified, which were found to be highly efficient in discriminating between the two the different types of fruit crops. And the classification was done using the SAM technique. And this is the classified image of the particular area where n number of crops like the coconut trees are there, then the mango is there, then lychee, uh, then different crops like maize, goa, banana, all these things they were able to classify with good, sufficiently very, very good accuracy. And these were some of the sensitive bands identified for discrimination of the different orchard crops. So this is, uh, till now we have discussed about discriminating between the two uh, different types of crops. And certain people have tried with how to distinguish between the different varieties of a same crop. So the people have attempted with a sugarcane crop. They have studied, the attempt was made to study distinguish between five different sugarcane varieties. These are the details of the varieties and these were the surface reflectance spectra collected from the Hyperion hyperspectral data of 30 meter resolution. You can see there are variations between the five different varieties. And these were some of the ground truth images. These are the fields where these different varieties were cultivated. So the multiple discriminant analysis, they are used to select the best variables among the surface reflectance values. Because in majority of these classifications, what people do is actually, you have n number of bands. So suppose you start from 400 to 2500. Suppose if you have every, every 10 nanometer interval also, if you have, then you will have around 250, uh, 250 to 260 bands. And after removing all the unwanted bands and other things, ultimately you will be in with uh, you will end with around 150 to 200 bands. So these 150 to 200 bands, all these things are nothing but the variables. These are the main predictor variables for your uh, whatever classification or the regression models. So among these, which all the maps you need to choose that you can statistically estimate. Uh, so among the best variables, they have chosen 10 and they have classified and they found that there is a very close matching between the, this is the ground truth and this is the classification image. You can see there are certain uh, uh, misclassification in certain bands. Ultimately, they were able to, and many of these uh, spectral bands or these variables, uh, which are collected using the reflectance values, the ratio of the reflectance, they are mainly sensitive to changes in the chlorophyll content, the leaf water content, as well as the lignin cellulose. Uh, composition order ratios. So the main mechanism, that's the that's what the mechanism which uh, uh, happens between the classification between different varieties. Uh, if someone is uh, acquainted with or mainly is aware about the sugarcane crop, you can see the people mainly use, uh, there are two different types of cropping types in case of sugarcane. One is known as the fresh crop and the thing is, is known as the ratoon, which emerges from the crop, uh, the stubbles, which once the first crop is cut. So the discrimination of fresh and ratoon sugarcane people have been doing because there is a variation in the sugarcane, the sugar content as well as the maturity levels and all these things vary between the fresh as well as the ratoon sugarcane. So this is an Everest MG uh, Postular Composite Image, which has been classified using different types of classification like the SAM, then hierarchical decision rules, using an absorption depth at different wavelengths. So the hierarchical decision tree using different decision rules and the continuum remote absorption depths, they were used to discriminate between the fresh and the two sugar cane. So the MD, uh, VI, WBI, MD, WI, and the, there are a number of indices depending on the specific crop or the different uh, specific wavelengths used. They were used in the decision tree classification and the thresholds were defined mainly based on the in-situ ground observations. So the spectral bands which show in maximum difference in the absorption depths, which are computed from the uh, 660 to 700 nanometer range and the 947 to 998. So these are the two wavelength ranges because here we can see there is a difference between significant difference between the different crop types, the normal sugar cane and the raton sugar cane. You can see there is a difference and here also there is a difference. So this wavelength, specifically these wavelength ranges were selected and the best available bands they were identified and they were used for discriminating the fresh as well as the raton sugarcane crops. 
And apart from this, people have been widely using this, especially for uh, estimation of the composition, mainly the uh, chemical composition of the vegetation is also very important. Especially the nitrogen content of the crop canopy, it is very uh, important because the plant nitrogen would uh, mainly have a direct impact on the yield, the productivity of the crop, and other things. So, in this particular region, uh, they have identified 10 narrow plant vegetation indices uh, using the ground spectra and they have correlated using the plant nitrogen content. So, we will be collecting some sort of field samples, we will be analyzing the nitrogen content, we will be estimating the vegetation indices values for those particular areas and we will be correlating with the nitrogen content. So, we will get a relationship with, uh, with increase in the nitrogen, the particular uh, we, we, can, we will be able to predict certain prediction models, uh, generate certain prediction models, especially for the estimation of nitrogen. So, the multiple regression model they have developed using the uh, wavelength based indices using the round spectra and they have applied to uh, every sense image to, so that we will get a spatial plant nitrogen map. It is a spatial distribution of the plant nitrogen so that we can identify the areas where we have a higher amount of nitrogen in the plant canopy because sometimes the higher amount of plant may delay the fruiting as well as the flowering of particular crops also. So they found that, that the plant nitrogen content in these different crops it varied from 0.5 to 4 percentage of the plant dry weight. It has also been used for the estimation of crop parameter uh, retrieval also. There are certain uh, canopy related transfer simulation models. They were used in the study for a trial of canopy parameters. Mainly, the canopy parameters widely used in the modern sensing communities LA, that is the leaf area index and the chlorophyll content. Because the mainly the reflectance pattern from an area, the yield, the net primary productivity, and the uh, crop production is mainly depending on the LAI as well as the chlorophyll content. So, if you know the LAI and the chlorophyll content, there are many uh, statistical as well as the physical process based models which can be used for uh, prediction of crop yield from the particular area. So, they were able to retrieve the leaf area index and the chlorophyll content includes with the chlorophyll A and B. They showed around 19 to 27 and 23 to 29 percentage deviation from the measured mean, especially with respect to the homogeneous and heterogeneous agricultural areas. Here you can see these are the measured chlorophyll content using the model and the retrieved using the model. There is a good correlation. From a spatial point of view, it's uh, more than sufficient. I will not say it is sufficient, but it's still there are scope for improvement also. Here you can see uh, for this is a false color composite, this is the LA for this particular area, and this is the chlorophyll content of the particular area. Similarly, people have not only for a agricultural crops, people have also tried for estimation of plant parameters like the leaf the chlorophyll for a big, bigger area with respect to forest soils because the forest chlorophyll content and the LA uh, mean. Uh, widely plays a very important role in the estimation of uh, net primary productivity and the uh, ecosystem productivity for various ecological studies also. So, this study was conducted using an IPD on data, uh, mainly by radiative transferring model, and they have used the continuum removal and the absorption feature characterization approaches, which we have mentioned earlier. And coming to another wide, uh, very important study, a uh, very important aspect of uh, hyperspectral remote sensing usage in uh, various crops, it is mainly, mainly for the disease detection, uh, that is one of the biotech stresses. The disease detection was conducted using an EI IPD on satellite image. So, this is the overall methodology the workers have adopted for, uh, so the IPD on data, they converted the radiance to top of atmosphere reflectance. And this is water stress index, this is uh, something which they have devised. Similarly, simultaneously, they have used a multi date NIS4 image of the same area for generation of crop mask using a decision tree based classification. They have resampled the 13 meter resolution, so both the data will have the same resolution. Ultimately, they correlated the disease scores with the disease water stress index and generated the disease map of the various crop pixels. So, the conduct, study was conducted in an ICIR institute, which is known as the National Research Center for Rape Seed and Mustard, which is located in the Bharatpur region of Pakistan. They have research farm as well as the farmers field they have used. They have because uh, there they have a uh, stress, uh, mainly the disease stress with respect to the mustard crop. So they have chosen the areas uh, uh, simultaneously. So the Hyperion data was used. So they have what they did was that they have 
divided, subdivided the entire spectral wavelength range into different ranges, starting from 650 to 1100, 1450 to 1850, 2000 to 2400 nanometers. And they found, and they were used, they used a pathological scoring technique. That means based on the symptoms on the leaf in a particular area, they will be uh, categorizing those particular areas belonging to this particular category. Uh, how much percentage is the grow, disease intensity? They will be mainly uh, the disease intensity. They will be mapping. So they found that the absorption in the red region that is named nearly around 681 nanometer with drastically reduced with the growth of the disease intensity. So these are the different graphs, uh, reflectance patterns of the plant uh, group of plants belonging to different disease intensities. Here you can see it is 15 percentage, 46, 36, and there are certain healthy vegetation. So they found that. In comparison to the healthy vegetation, the reflectance of the uh, disease affected uh, crops or the disease affected plants it decreased at 681 nanometer. And they found that also in this particular wavelength range of 1450 to 1850, also at 1660 nanometer, the diseased crop showed a drastic increase in uh, reflectance from 0.12 uh, to 0.17. Here you can see. For disease severity increases from 0 to 46. So the topmost uh, one, the topmost one shows the disease infested crop. So here, here you can see with increase in drastically, there is an increase in uh, reflectance values of the particular disease crops. So there the separability analysis it revealed that at around 1660 nanometer, the reflectance of the healthy and the diseased crops they are significantly separable. And the, whereas the highest reflectance in, difference in the reflectance was found at uh, 2143 uh, nanometer among the various diseases. So for the identification of various disease crops, because the stress and the variations in the reflectance, it can be due to either it can be due to diseases or it can be either due to water stress because of the drought conditions also. So in order to identify, there are disease water stress indices widely used. So there are different types of indices using different band combinations. Here the 1660 nanometer we have identified in this wavelength range and the 60, 680 nanometer. The ratio it gives the disease water stress index which is 3 and it was found to be the best correlated with the disease score. So they have generated a exponential equation and uh, simultaneously they computed the multi-date uh, list score data. They classified it as a decision tree and a mustard crop mask. So the ultimately the relationship for identification of deceased crops, it will be uh, applied only onto the pixels which contain the mustard crop. And the DWSI derived from, it was superimposed onto the crop mask and it varied from 1.4 to 1.7 for disease score. So here in this key, we can see the false color composite of the particular area. Here you can see the green color mainly in the, uh, depicts the normal mustard crop where we don't have much issue with respect to the disease and here we can see the red colors in between they show mainly the disease mustard crop areas and the rest of the areas have been masked the non agriculture and the non mustard crops they have been masked it has also been widely used especially when there is a large patch of the area has been uh, cultivated with the same type of crop as well as the same type of variety and it has been widely adopted Similarly, in similar attempt also has been done using the every G data also, which is a much finer resolution data. Here they have used the disease index and the absorption depth based classification was also used to discriminate between the healthy and the diseased wheat crop. Here the leaf rust disease was uh, specifically targeted uh, using the disease severity index 1 and 2. The characteristic wavelength regions they have identified which are responsive to different uh, disease were well, they were found to be 660 to 700 and 2155 to 2175 nanometer. They were widely able to distinguish between the infested crop using different techniques. So coming to the some of the applications with respect to specifically with respect to soils, uh, the Everest data or any of the hyperspectral data can be used. Uh, this thing, uh, the myself had done this work for mainly for uh, discrimination of different types of soils using every SMG data. So this is the every SMG false color composite uh, from the Hyderabad area, uh, the, near the Ikrisat campus. Here we have two different categories of soil. This is the red type of soil and these are the black color soil. So our attempt was mainly to uh, 
to op obtain an optimum number of uh, bands or optimum components which can easily identify between two different types of uh, soils that is red soil and the predominantly black soil so we are classified using the all the reflectance data was classified using a sand classifier and svm classifier was used using the reflectance data and similarly the svm classified in, uh, classification was undertaken using the first 20 mnf components so we the uh, we found that the use of the MNS components they altogether improved the so classification results and ultimately we were able to uh, with respect to these three classes we were able to get an overall classification accuracy of more than eighty five whereas the red soil we were able to identify much more clearly in compared to the black soil and coming to Another very important aspect for which hyperspectral remote sensing has been used in case of soil studies is mainly for the characterization of various land degradation types. And soil salinity is one of the most predominant and very important uh, land degradation type, especially in case of the arid, semi arid, as well as the subhumid regions where the rainfall is slightly less when compared to the evaporative losses. So, this study was conducted in IARS, uh, it was conducted in the Madhura district of Uttar Pradesh. The area is mainly characterized as a semi arid climate. High period data was used, and then all the standard pre processing uh, techniques, uh, pre processing steps were followed, like the bad band removal, the stripe removal, the conversion of reflectance. And a reconnaissance survey was conducted in the particular area for identification of the salt affected areas, as well as the collection of surface and subsurface soil samples along with their GPS locations. The physical chemical characteristics of the salt affected soils, which is collected from the particular area, has been given in this particular table. So normal soils, these are certain of the parameters. ECE indicates mainly the electrical conductivity of the uh, saturation extract. ESP mainly indicates the exchangeable sodium percentage and the SAR mainly indicates a sodium absorption ratio. We only just keep in mind that these are the various uh, chemical uh, indicators or the parameters which are widely used to describe the salinity, whether it is slightly saline, moderately or highly saline. So as a take home message, I will say if the electrical conductivity is more than four, the salt, the, uh, the soil is uh, saline. And with increase in the electrical conductivity value, the salinity, severe, the severity of the salt composition also increases. So what they did was they had the remote sensing image of the area. They had the chemical characteristics of the soil samples from the same area. They did a correlation analysis of the spectral bands with soil salinity parameters. Among the uh, large number of bands, they found that these number of bands corresponding to these different wavelengths, they were found to have a good correlation with the electrical conductivity as well as the pH values of the soil samples. So among these, uh, using these different bands, certain spectral indices, they were generated based on the standard formula like the NDVI, you might have heard about this, the cursory, uh, NDSI, the brightness, coloration, saturation, this is the combined soil reflectance index. These are the equations which were used for generation of the spectral indices. So once the spectral indices were generated, uh, a correlation analysis was further conducted to identify among these different spectral indices which we have generated, which among them actually corresponds to or are responsive to variations in the soil salinity parameters. They found that among these different uh, spectral indices, the salinity index as well as the brightness index they were found to have very good correlation with electrical conductivity, sodium percentage, as well as absorption ratio. So among these five, these two were generated. And similarly, SD analysis was also done to study the effectiveness of these different, we have different spectral indices. So among these, which among the uh, these five spectral indices, which one is highly able to discriminate between the different degrees of salinity, whether to distinguish between slight, moderate, severe, and very severe salinity classes, so they found that based on the results, the high F value uh, from the analysis, it indicates the more separability. So they found that the salinity index and the brightness index was found to be highly able to distinguish between the different degrees of salinity. So once we know that, then a regression equation or for the prediction of salinity was developed between the spectral indices and the soil salinity parameters. These are the prediction equations. So these prediction equations were applied onto a spatial uh, domain in order to generate this spatial distribution of the soil parameter uh, using salinity index as well as the brightness index. So from this image, we can see which are all the areas which are having normal uh, soils, which are the areas having slightly salt affected soils, moderately salt affected soils, as well as the 
highly salt affected soils we can uh, define so this is uh, important from a management point of view because the mainly the management of degraded soils or the degraded lands it is mainly uh, based on the severity because the highly the most severe areas will be given the topmost priority similarly uh, Hyperspectral data has also been uh, used mainly for estimation of various soil parameters like the soil organic matter, which is a very important component of soil, uh, determining the performance of the soil by influencing various physical, chemical, as well as the biological properties. So, the soil organic matter, uh, what people have done is that they have used a hyperion image, they have done all the standard procedures, the reflectance they call it. Ultimately, they have mainly uh, computed the color indices from this particular image. Similarly, they have used the measurement of organic matter for the soil samples collected from the area. They have done a correlation between the uh, soil organic matter content of the particular area with the uh, different indices values. The weakness indices are basically the brightness, the coloration, hue, redness, and the saturation using various combinations. And they generate a multivariate regression model. So that if we know the value of these MR, uh, these different indices, we can compute the organic matter. So using the coloration index and the hue index, they were able to predict soil organic matter for the particular area. And a good relationship between the measured organic matter content and the predicted ones, it conveyed that we can predict the soil organic matter content with around 75 to 80 percent confidence. And this is the and they have applied this particular developed and validated model onto the remote sensing image and they generate a continuous map of soil organic matter. Here you can see the vegetation and the water areas they have masked because of the there will not be any direct reflections from the soil. So here you can see how the organic matter content is specially varying in this particular region. Similarly, the hyperspectral data has also been used for uh, retrieval of various physical chemical parameters, especially with respect to salt affected soils. Why the salt of people have been studying more and more uh, using hyperspectral data for studying salt affected soils? Because the salts they have a peculiar influence on the soil, mainly with respect to the reflection patterns as well as the magnitude. The study was conducted in uh, Ahmedabad district of Gujarat. The area was characterized by, you know, the area of Ahmedabad is very hot and semi-arid. All the pre-processing was done. They were converted into reflectance data. The MNF transformation was done for dimensional anti-reduction. The spectral library for different types of salinity or the different salinity classes was also generated. And the derivation of various absorption feature parameters. So, absorption feature parameters are mainly the depth, the width, the asymmetry, the area, the location of the middle wavelength, all these things were estimated. And this is the correlation matrix between the electrical conductivity and the absorption feature parameters of the area. You can see majority of the sand within the this particular wavelength range, the electrical conductivity is having sufficiently good uh, correlation values with various parameters like the depth, the width, the area, the symmetry, and all other things. This particular graph, this is mainly generated using the field collected information, the field collected soil samples. We can see the the non-saline soil is basically the green, the lower lower graph. Here we can see with slight increase in the salt content, the reflectance of the particular soil is increasing. It's getting more and more increasing. The severely saline soils, you can see this is the red one, then the blue is one. And depending on the nature of the salt, also there may be variations. Here we can see. It. So the take home message is that with increase in the salt concentration, the overall reflectance of the soil gets increased. And they found that when they took the entire wavelength range and did the modeling, they found that the electrical conductivity, the area as well as the depth of the absorption features of the salt affected soils, they mainly decrease with the increasing electrical conductivity, ESP as well as the CEC values. And they have generated regression equations, uh, mainly for the prediction of various components. And they have generated the uh, predictive models using a chemometric technique which is known as the PLSR technique that is the partial least square regression analysis. So the electrical conductivity, exchangeable sodium percentage, magnesium concentration as well as the cation exchange capacity they were able to predict with sufficiently moderate accuracies. So finally the distribution of the different categories of salt affected soils they were mapped using the spectral library which were generated using the standard spectra of different classes. 
and the spatial distribution map using the by making use of the spectral library and the spectral angle mapper method with considerable accuracy of around 89 percentage these are the different producer user accuracy and the kappa coefficient related to with different classes here you can see uh, as the severity increases, it becomes more and more. There will be the, the most confusion among when we go for classification will be between the normal soil and the slightly salt affected soils. The least confusion will be between the normal soil and the severely salt affected soils because the reflectance pattern and the brightness values will be quite significantly different from each other. So it's always because the impact of salt on the soil surface so that it can affect uh, the reflectance pattern and have an impact on the satellite or the sensor reading, it happens only when the uh, salt concentration is slightly at the higher rates. Similarly, people have been uh, using the airborne data also from the precision agriculture point of view, mainly for the soil organic carbon mapping in case of uh, various crop fields. So they have collected soil samples uh, from the different the study area locations simultaneous with the passage of the uh, sensor through over the area. And even people have, even the others have conducted certain experiments in the laboratory where they have used controlled digestion using acids uh, so that uh, we have a set of high organic carbon soils. By using controlled digestion, the organic carbon will be uh, reduced gradually and correspondingly what is the change or the impact on the spectra they will be having. So here you can see the this is the spectral reflectance curves corresponding to soil samples with variations in organic carbon uh, whereas the other physical and chemical properties are more or less similar. And using the various PLSR techniques, they have identified certain wavelength regions which can highly sensitive to variations in organic carbon. And the predictive models for prediction and mapping, they have developed using PLSR and linear regression models between, and they have applied on the sense using the sensitive bands applied onto the study area. Here you can see the variations, the high uh, color indicates the high organic carbon content, and similarly, the gradations and the fertility zonation maps can be generated in diverse areas. Similarly, the study has also been extended to uh, different uh, mapping of various other properties also, not only the carbon carbon, it can also be used for, but only thing is that the area should be slightly devoid of vegetation so that whenever the sensor is used or the satellite passes, we should get a clear signature, pure signature from the fields without much uh, in hindrance from vegetation or the moisture impacts. So the predictive model was also used for using the selected wavelengths. The validated models were used for mapping, spatial mapping of carbon as well as the nitrogen contents. But uh, here only the uh, model was applied only onto the bare pixels, wherever the NDVA uh, using an NDVA thresholding technique, wherever the vegetation is present, the model will not be valid. Similarly, it has also been used for the identification of various types of uh, clay minerals because the clay minerals are a very important component or the constituent of uh, soil because they define the chemical properties or the crop suitability, the water holding capacity. So many of these things are dependent on the nature of the clay types or the clay particles present. So here the study was conducted in uh, two districts of uh, Madhya Pradesh. Soil sampling was done, and the soil samples were used mainly for the XRD, that is known as the X-ray diffraction analysis, which is a standard analytical procedure for identification of uh, clay minerals, type of clay minerals, and for spectral analysis. So the mineral identification was done using XRD, and this is the absorption features using the spectra. They were identified by characterizing the shape and the wavelength position of the strongest absorption features. I hope you might have seen this during the previous lectures. How this is the normal uh, wavelength, uh, sorry, the normal absorption feature, and this is a continuum. So when we remove this continuum, this particular uh, absorption uh, reflectance peak or the absorption peak, it becomes something like this. And uh, by absorption feature characterization, what we may mean, uh, what we mean is that basically we identify measure the depth of this particular feature. This is the width, and this is the, what is the area of this feature. What is the uh, asymmetry and many other things, they are numerically calculated. So, these are the absorption feature parameters mainly the position of the center of the absorption band, what is the depth, what is the width, what is the area, and asymmetry of the continuum remote spectrum. And this is the uh, 
peak produce the claim interval identification is done using the XRD. These are the different peak producing despacings in Armstrong corresponding to various clay levels like carbonate, vermiculite, fillite, monomorphonite, and both. This is the from the image. This is the normal spectra we obtained from the image, and this is the continuum remote spectra of the of a cavernite dominant soil sample. Cavernite is nothing but it is a one is to one type of soil clay mineral, mainly predominantly found in case of the red colored soils, mainly in the Deccan tract, uh, like in Karnataka, Andhra, Maharashtra, parts of Maharashtra also. Uh, so the dominant clay mineral in the soil samples they were predicted. By using the absorption feature parameters, they were used as the input parameters using a machine learning algorithm known as the run forest approach. It's a run forest classification basically. And among the different absorption feature parameters, the width of the absorption, uh, width of absorption. In the particular image, you can see this is the distance from this side to this side. This is called as the width. So the width of the absorption, it was found to be the most important variable for prediction, which explains around 31% of the variance present in the samples. And the unknown samples they were able to classify with an accuracy of around 79 to 80 percentage. So, further, the Hyperion data which they are used, they are used for classifying using a sample algorithm. And the, how they train the algorithm, the algorithm was trained mainly based on the field observations, whether it is a red colored soil or a black colored soil, because the black colored or the swelling and shrilling type of soils, which mainly occur in the uh, the black cotton soil areas, grown, cotton growing areas of Karnataka, Andhra, uh, some parts of Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra also, and MP also, they mainly predominantly contain a mineral which is known as the monomorphone, which is a two is to one type of expanding type of clay minerals, which imparts the particular characteristics to the particular soil because it swells and shrinks mainly based on the moisture content. So they found that the cavernite, that is the one is to one type of clay mineral, it was found to be the dominant mineral present in the study area followed by the Montemorillonite. And the overall accuracy of the classification for the area was found to be 68.43 percent. Uh, the another thing they were observed that the study area, the uplands or uplands where the drainage or the waterlogging is less and the drainage conditions are good. They are mainly occupied by the non-expanding type of clay minerals, while the lowlands or the bottom lands where there is a, a chances of water saturation or water loading, they are dominated by expanding type of clay minerals, that is the 2 is to 1 type of monomorphic type of clay minerals. And this is the image which shows the distribution. There is a gradation distribution between the, the distribution of this is the lower portion, it mainly contains some monomorphic type of clay, whereas the blue areas or the higher elevation areas are dominated by the cavernity type of clay minerals. Notably, with respect to the different composite components of land degradation, like soil erosion or the salinity, it has also been people have used for uh, mapping the land degradation in totality. Also, people have used this particular type of thing. So, the reflectance spectra uh, of soils at different desertification. I hope you might people might have heard about something known as desertification. Uh, so. They got the samples or they got the ground spectra belonging to different types of desertified soils like the no desertification area, slight, moderate, as well as the high desertification areas. So, based on that, they have classified based on different uh, indices like the soil adjusted with index, desertification soil index, soil organic matter index, iron oxide index, and the normalized difference water index. They have based a rule based classification. They found that within the particular area, if the value of the particular index is falling within this particular range, then it belongs to the slightly degraded area, moderate degradation, as well as the high degradation. So, this degradation classes they are mainly defined mainly based on certain policy guidelines as well as the local indicators. Indicators are mainly how the uh, ecosystem performs with respect to crop production, grazing, uh, ability to provide grazing material to the animals, livestock production, and other things. So, based on this land degradation system uh, developed. They have done the land degradation mapping using a neural network as well as a support vector machine, and they were able to classify between the uh, normal, no degradation or the normal soils, the slightly degraded areas, the moderately degraded areas, as well as the high degradation areas with good accuracies ranging from 85 to 90 percent. So, uh, this is in short uh, with respect to the various applications for which. Hypercentral remote sensing data has been used by various researchers across the globe uh, within our country as well as in other countries. 
there are the applications are not limited to what we have discussed but within the limited time i just try to showcase what are the major applications with which hyperspectral remote sensing data has been used by uh, various workers so that's it uh, from my side i think the time yeah well i have stopped well within my time so if you have any further queries i will be happy to answer that Hello. Uh, is there any uh, questions from the participants? Justin, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, okay, I think I have one uh, question. Um, uh, see, uh, at Technology Innovation Hub, we are kind of asking uh, many proposals which are mostly on product development. So, how do you see? Uh, especially hyperspectral <coughs> sensing in agriculture because you know precision agriculture is one of the big thing uh, and uh, how do you think like we can use a leverage on hyperspectral remote sensing uh, to come up with some products if you can give us some direction yeah. for a research uh, for a package be really good sir uh, i'm really sorry to say that still uh, hyperspectral remote sensing is still in the development stages in our country. It's may not only because the our researchers are not capable, only the main issue which hinders our development of hyperspectral research, carrying forward in the research and developing certain products is mainly the non-availability of the data on a continuous basis. Because majority of the studies are used, if you go through the literature, the majority of the studies people have used is something referred to as the Hyperion data, which was a, a test satellite by the US it was supposed to uh, uh, deliver uh, for only up to 5 to 10 years, but it lasted for around uh, 15 to 16 years. But after that, we don't have any uh, data till now, which is uh, which provides a, a regular update of hyperspectral, which provides a regular hyperspectral uh, image of an, any area. And this every and every SMG, they are basically airborne data. So these airborne data, they are mainly uh, captured on a mission mode only based on the request or the collaboration between different agencies and and rest of all the other hyperspectral work people do are mainly using ground ground based data and this ground based data is highly variable also and uh, expanding it into a further larger scale it becomes a difficult for a precision agriculture point of view that's the main uh, hindrance with respect to adoption of hyperspectral data and another thing nowadays people have been working with uh, people have started working using the drone technology or the UAV technology by using certain hyperspectral uh, cameras, mainly for uh, precision agriculture point of view on a farm or a small scale basis because the uh, area a particular UAV can capture it in one go, that's also limited to only a few kilometers. So that's the state of the affairs right now. Sir. Okay. Uh, uh, is it like if I start creating a, there's also what we are thinking at Technology Innovation Hub to create a, a meta metadata center is one thing to find out. Uh, of course, the government of India is also working in this direction. Will it be advisable for us to keep collecting the samples so that the uh, students, researchers can use this data for their research? Will it, do, do you advise that we should 
create such kind of a test data sets for uh, researchers yes sir from a uh, researcher point of view i will strongly advocate keeping a database but again the practicality and how many people will be ready to contribute the data that's another issue because the issue because uh, from a national perspective we have been collecting data since independence we have a large amount of data in different different hands but we uh, we don't have a central repository till now with respect to this uh, crop stuff uh, with respect to the statistics we have but the ground collected information and other things we are lacking in a, a common data pool and a common data center because nowadays the things have been improving uh, because of the data sharing policy and open data policy initiated by the government of india now the things are changing but the initiative should come from i feel from the different institutes itself because whatever data is from a higher order if there is an instruction that all the field data you have collected you should make it an open with proper uh, geotagging and all those things that will be a very good initiative for many end users uh, as well as the technology developers okay um thank you uh, is there any questions from the audience i mean this attendees okay okay uh, thank you uh, uh, justin it was great to hear about agriculture and soil studies on hyper using hyperspectral remote sensing i think we'll be in touch with you uh, i think we'll see how uh, technology innovation hub can kind of bring you as an expert on our team for future studies and workshops and seminars thank you again yeah thank you sir Thanks everyone for your patient hearing and thanks for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.
సార్ ఆర్ ఏబుల్ టు హియర్ మీ మీకు కంప్యూటర్ లో నా వాయిస్ వస్తుందా okay uh, participants just give us a couple of minutes we are just trying to get uh, the speaker connected thank you
Okay, I request all the uh, attendees, please be patient. We are just trying to fix his uh, microphone. There's an issue with the presenter's microphone. We'll get back to you soon.
uh yeah sorry for the delay uh just hang on for a couple of minutes i think we'll just try to finalize this mic settings we're just about to get things right thank you കണ്ടിന്യൂ ചെയ്യണ ഒരു നാ പിക്ചർ കൂടെ വസ്തുന്ന 
ఇక్కడ ఇప్పుడు కెమెరా ఉంది మైక్ ఉంది మైక్ పక్కన ఒక యారో ఉంది చేశా షేర్ స్క్రీన్ షేర్ మెటీరియల్ షేర్ స్క్రీన్ ఎంటైర్ స్క్రీన్ చూజ్ వాట్ టు షేర్ ఎంటైర్ స్క్రీన్ క్లిక్ చేసి విండోన్ చేయమంటారు ఇప్పుడు సెలెక్ట్ అయింది కానీ ఎంటైర్ స్క్రీన్ అంటే రావటం లేదు విండో అని అలా అన్నాను వచ్చేస్తా చూడండి ఇప్పుడు షేర్ వచ్చిందా ఇప్పుడు వాయిస్ కూడా వినిపిస్తుందా అమ్మయ్య అంటే నాకు ఇవ్వండి పర్వాలేదు టూ మినిట్స్ ఐ హావ్ సారీ సార్ సారీ ఫర్ ఆల్ ద ఇన్కన్వీనియన్స్ దట్ హాస్ బీన్ కాస్ట్ నో ఇష్యూ నో ప్రాబ్లం ఓకే uh thank you sir uh, thank you for all your patience <laughs> and uh, so yeah we have uh, come to the uh, last session of the workshop uh, we are very happy to have you have uh, professor anji reddy maraty sir here with us for this workshop thank you sir thank you for immediately accepting our invitation and uh, uh, being a key speaker of this workshop your presence means a lot to us sir hello can you hear me sir uh, yeah yeah i am able to hear no problem yes sir so uh, uh, so with uh, no further delay i am here to introduce uh, sir dr uh, professor anji reddy maradi mtech civil engineering from indian institute of technology uh, kanpur india joined jawaharlal technological university hyderabad in 1989 he was awarded the doctoral degree by jntu in 1995 in uh, environmental geomatics he had been having more than 33 years of teaching and research experience in remote sensing and gis environmental impact assessment geoinformatics for environmental management and is presently working as a professor and director in jawaharlal nehru technological university hyderabad uh, he worked as the principal guide for more than 200 projects at pg level 41 phd projects and at presently guiding more than 8 phd students in the area of environmental science and technology geoinformatics remote sensing gis gps eia and environmental applications he has executed number of research projects sponsored by state and gen, uh, say state and central government and completed more than 30 consultancy projects in various applications of remote sensing and gis in environmental management planning and eia he published and presented more than 176 research papers he developed uh, he delivered expert lectures in usa sweden japan Thailand, UK, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Nigeria, China, Singapore, and Dubai. He authored few textbooks, namely Remote Sensing and Geographical Information Systems, Geoinformatics for Environmental Management, Digital Image Processing and Environmental Science, uh, Environmental Science and Technology, Environmental Impact Assessment, 
theory and practice, and also edited the 10 preceding volumes of International Conference on Environmental Management. He's been a reviewer and referee for various national and international journals. He is the National Expert Committee member for revival of village pond projects, Earth and Environmental Science Expert Committee for the Empowerment of Women, Expert Member of the Project Koleru Lake uh, Restoration Management Plan of DST, Expert Working Groups Member of Hyperspectral Signature Database Creation Project, and Village Knowledge Management Systems of NRDM's DST. He has also worked as the former chairman of Andhra Pradesh State Environmental Expert Appraisal Committee and constituted by the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Forest Government of uh, India with the recommendation of Government of Andhra Pradesh. He has received numerous awards. He has been awarded the Rotary Vocational Excellence Award 2009 presented by the Rotary Cup of Bhagyanagar. AP Scientist Award 2010 by the Government of Andhra Pradesh in recognition of outstanding services rendered in the areas of environmental science and technology, remote sensing and surveying and mapping. Best Teacher Award in 2012 by the Government of Andhra Pradesh. Indira Gandhi Excellence Award uh, from Indira Gandhi Excellence Award by International Business Council, New Delhi. The Bharat Ratna Shri uh, Moksha Gundam Vishweshwaraya Award 2013, Government of Andhra Pradesh and Institute of Engineers, and Fellow, uh, Fellow of Andhra Pradesh Academy of Science Award by India. Great, sir, really a great uh, list of achievements. For his outstanding contributions in environmental problem solving, pollution, control, health and safety, GIS and remote sensing applications for water quality, transportation planning, assessment of sedimentation distribution pattern, EIA, socio-economic development through scientific means. He stood not only as a distinguished professor in JNTU, but also at national and international levels, he has achieved great heights. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you very much for being a part of our workshop. I, I hand it over the presentation. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Andy, for a very good uh, reading about my biodata. Anyhow, it is very late. Uh, yes. I have around uh, twenty-five to twenty, I think twenty-nine slides. Uh, yeah, yes. Though, though my topic, what I find is uh, hyperspectral remote sensing of environmental applications. If I say environmental applications, it's a very, very vast subject. Uh, for in a, in a given one hour time, it's very difficult to cover all the applications. And in our lab, we have more than 20 applications we did on uh, by using geomatics because my wing is itself uh, is the environmental geomatics uh, division in, in Institute of Science and Technology. And we have six faculty members working in the uh, in this field. We have MTech environmental management as well as MTech Environmental Geomatics. And you have, we have a, a MSc Environmental <laughs> Science and Technology. These are the postgraduate programs. We don't have any undergraduate programs in my center or in my department. And we are very, very specialized in the area of environmental geomatics in various applications. And we have executed more than, uh, altogether more than 80 uh, sponsored research projects. Out of that, I only executed around 35 projects and uh, and almost all projects almost all students were uh, students of uh, who did my phd under uh, under the guidance of myself so almost all did their projects sponsored by uh, the state or uh, central government organization this is also one of the projects uh, sponsored by ministry of uh, uh, environment i think so it's very uh, five years back and uh, and one of my research student, my PhD student, did uh, in this area of research. She did hyperspectral remote sensing of uh, specifically, very particularly, water quality mapping. How the spatial distribution maps can be generated by using hyperspectral remote sensing data and in situ data collected. This is uh, what I am going to present. I don't want to go fundamentals of hyperspectral remote sensing because perhaps the previous speakers would have given all those uh, uh, fundamentals now i would like to 
straight away I would like to touch upon the application part of how the water quality can be monitored, water quality can be mapped, spatial variations can be understood using hyperspectral remote sensing data. So this is what my presentation is. Now, uh, is it visible to all of you, my dear uh, participants? So yes, sir, it's visible. Are okay. you changing the slides? Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, sir, we are not able to see the slide change. We are only seeing the first slide. You, you come out of the slides, this thing, sir. It is okay. Second slide is okay. No, sir, you have to click directly on the slides because it's going in a presentation mode. Uh, okay. Now it is okay. Right? No, How sir. Is you, that? Huh? you press press escape, sir. Come out of the uh, presentation mode. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> oh, presentation mode only you want to see? Ah, yeah, like this, it's okay, sir. Now this is fine. Is now we are now? In... Yes, yes. Oh, now it okay, is... then, then I, I have given a slideshow, which is not possible here, right? Yes, yes, sir, yes. Okay, no problem. No problem. See, this slide says, just to you, let us go through this slide so that you can, uh, we can revise the fundamentals of hyperspectral. Hyperspectral remote sensing is the science of acquiring digital imagery of earth materials in many narrow contiguous spectral band. This is what we should know. The hyperspectral sensors are imaging spectrometers measure at the materials and produce complete spectral signatures with no wavelength emissions. This is, there is a lot of difference between the electromagnetic remote sensing and the hyperspectral remote sensing. If you see the electromagnetic remote sensing, we talk about, always we talk about visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and we if you see the hyperspectral, within that wavelength region, so how best we can narrow down the range of the wavelength regions, that is that is where hyperspectral remote sensing works. The instruments which are measured, the hyperspectral sensing data are flown ab above, aboard space and airborne platforms. Handheld versions also exist and are used for accuracy assessment missions and small scale investigations. And the see, in this digital airborne imaging spectrometer is also one of the instruments which are generally used in our lab and which is having 63 bands and 27 in the visible. See, what is the visible region? 0 0.4 4 to 0 0.5, 0 0.7 is the visible region of the spectrum. Within that, you can have 27 in the visible and near infrared, that means 0 0.4 to 1.0 microns, and two in the short wave infrared, and again 28 bands in the short wave infrared, important for mapping clay minerals and mineral that can be used in the geological, mineralogical applications. And there are six bands in the thermal infrared. So that's why the ability to measure reflectance in several contiguous bands across specific part of a spectrum allows these instruments to produce a spectral curve that can be compared to reference spectra. This is where we should always concentrate the reference spectra, that means the library, the library of the spectral reflectance curves uh, in the hyperspectral region of the electromagnetic spectrum, and which is very, very much useful, not only for environmental applications, it can be useful for any geological applications, mineralogical applications, even to identify a particular mineral, we can use sometimes use the hyperspectral uh, remote sensing. Now, see, this is just broadly, I have given the, uh, the, the, the essence of hyperspectral remote sensing here. And, and again, if you come to my, my uh, actual water quality issues, the, what I, this is very general uh, thing, my, I'm going to touch this is the, uh, we have different lakes. You can have a look on this slide. We have the Indian and we have Telangana region of uh, in, uh, India. We have different uh, districts. And within that, we have the uh, Hyderabad. You see the different lakes. There are number of lakes in Hyderabad. So each and every blue dot indicates one lake in Hyderabad city. Number of dots are there. You see, just, you know, uh, try to see with the uh, concentration, you have number of dots. Each dot indicates one 
lake in hyderabad hyderabad and sikandarabad city and the number of lakes are encroached by human uh, beings and uh, anthropological uh, references are there and the almost all lakes today we are seeing uh, uh, lakes which are there almost you know 50 years back you can't see today that is the unfortunate thing in hyderabad city but even then and we have considered some very important lakes uh, for our study one is the shamir pet lake and the other one is the usain sagar lake which is the very center of hyderabad city and that separates uh, sikandarabad and hyderabad and once upon a time that means 400 years back and this Hussein Sagar Lake was basically a drinking water lake. Today, today, no more, you know, we can't say that it is a drinking water lake. If you insert your finger, your finger will be spoiled. That is the, uh, the present scenario, present status of the lake water. And the, the fourth, uh, the third lake, what we considered is the uh, Miralam Lake. And fourth one is the Umdal Sagar. These are the four uh, prominent lakes, what we have considered for our study. In addition to that, you have the drinking water lakes and two lakes are there. That is, one is the Usman Sagar Lake, other one is the Gandipeta Lake. These two, today also, we are using uh, these lakes for our drinking purpose uh, for the uh, needs of uh, Hyderabad and Sikandarabad uh, uh, cities. So, this is the uh, our study area, what we considered in our uh, project. And in this project, and we have, uh, you know, we have uh, considered because of the uh, the pollution problems are there around these lakes. That's why we took the very complicated lakes in Hyderabad city for our study. Now, you can see here, you see how the Usain Sagar Lake water appears. You see, it is a, 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 a ground-based uh, uh, photographs. These photographs are ground-based photographs of the water of Hussein Sagar Lake appears, Miralam tank water appears, Shamir Pet Lake water appears, and the Umda Sagar Lake appears. In the Umda Sagar Lake, uh, you have the weeds, numbers, different types of weeds you can see. Unfortunately, uh, this water is highly polluted water. How the spectral reflection curves, the spectral, how the low altitude remote sensing, how the hyperspectral remote sensing can help us to to, de to demarcate or to determine the status of the water quality of these lakes we have studied. And remember, and the, if you see the lake water of all these four lakes, and you can't, you know, you can uh, you can have very complex phenomena, complex methodology can, you can adapt, you can derive from uh, this uh, type of case studies. And for this case study, we have, uh, uh, Basically, we have reviewed the existing literature, not only in India, other countries also, how uh, the hyperspectral remote sensing is useful for uh, water quality monitoring or water quality mapping or water quality measurements, how it is uh, the hyperspectral remote sensing have uh, been used by different others different uh, in different countries. And we have uh, reviewed the literature. In this literature also, you can see conventional techniques of, for wa water quality, water quality indices, multispectral remote sensing for water quality, hyperspectral remote sensing for water quality, and imaging spectroscopy. And all these in, in these broad areas, we have reviewed the literature. Ultimately, we have uh, come to a conclusion that, that the hyperspectral remote sensing definitely can be uh, dominantly can be used uh, for water quality mapping. And you, this is the generation of how we are we are going to generate the spectral signatures. And the, remember, the spectral signatures, what we have generated can be kept in the archives, can be kept in the library of uh, spectral reflectance curves, which can be used for the reference curves for any environment, for, uh, for any areas where the similar environmental settings, if you are able to observe. And then finally, the processing of how the people, how different investigators across the globe have analyzed and processed the hyperspectral data for water quality mapping. With that also, we have, uh, we have surveyed. And finally, we used some methodology 
and the characterization and modeling of spectral signatures. And of course, these are the websites. Those who would like to, uh, they, those who would like to do some research on in this area, and they can uh, they can note down all these websites. These websites are very very prominent websites, and which are very useful for the uh, for for the research uh, of this kind. My dear participants, are are, are are you able to listen? Are uh, are you able to hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. We are able to hear you. Okay, please. Because you know this is online. Sometimes it will be <laughs> confusion. No, no, sir. If any anything is like that, we will immediately inform you. Sir. Please, please, yeah. please. please. Yeah, yeah. Now this is the methodology what we have used in our study. In this methodology. Uh, we have collected some data products, data collection, and uh, in this data collection, field reflectance measurement at selected sampling points with our uh, spectral radiometer, handheld spectral radiometer, and after that, we have collected the features where we have taken uh, the samples. And the, if you see the other uh, parallel, parallelly, we 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 done, we conducted in situ sampling survey at selected points for water quality parameters, and then in situ analysis of quality parameters and parameter concentration. And here in this, uh, uh, this is parallelly we did again field survey uh, using spectral radiometer, and we have extracted the features and field data, and 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 here we use the Hyperion. Hyperion is the very, very important uh, sensor on board satellite and this is the hyperspectral sensing system is Hyperion, and this Hyperion uh, data has been used in our water quality study. And uh, again, we have formulated the uh, models, and those models were validated by regression analysis by statistical principles. And if you see the hyperspectral state satellite imagery for this uh, draw data, and we have pre-processed and corrected atmospheric corrections are applied, and finally, the the extract in spectral signatures, end member selection, selection of spectral signatures of water in different lakes. That is very, very important. The characterization of quality parameters in terms of the uh, total suspended uh, index and the water quality index. Finally, we have prepared the preparation of spatial distribution maps of quality parameters. And this flowchart gives the entire uh, methodology adopted for this study, but, but but fortunately or unfortunately, if we want to conduct each step in this methodology, and it's not that easy, it takes some months together. In some uh, in some point, some steps, we took mother, months together uh, to to do that in a very precision level. If we use hyperspectral data itself, we should always talk about the precision levels. If you don't talk about the precision levels. If you don't talk about the accuracy point of use, obviously your analysis using hyperspectral signatures is a very, very biased one. Not only in environmental applications like water quality mapping or you know soil soil quality or you know agricultural productivity and agricultural soils and all these things where the hyperspectral remote sensing has been used very intensively, very prominently, very dominantly with high precision levels. If you don't talk about the accuracy and the precision, obviously use of hyperspectral is there is no use and, and you can use as a, as well uh, multispectral, which is having very wide uh, bands. So this methodology, uh, what we have adopted, this methodology is uh, definitely uh, worked out to get the uh, good uh, spatial distribution maps of water quality of lakes. You, this uh, see these four lakes: Usmir, Usain Sagar Lake, Umda Sagar Lake, Shamir Pet Lake, and then Mir Al Alam Lake. These four lakes are, you know, uh, distributed in Hyderabad city in uh, different directions. And uh, the sampling locations you see we use and set collecting the sampling sample pre-sampling locations, identifying the pre-sampling locations in a water body itself is not a small task and and because 
it is water wherever it uh, you can see the same thing there is no landmark there is nothing like that if it is land you can have the landmark here you don't have except you have the the gps uh, instrument with the help of the gps instrument with the help of the lang longitude and latitude we have collected the samples uh, water samples uh, for each and every uh, uh, lake and uh, and you can see the number of samples numbering also you can have uh, sampling position one, two, three, like that. We have collected and we analyzed in our Center for Environment lab. And in that lab, the uh, parameter measurements, we have almost all uh, this one. And you see how we can have the locations, how we have identified, uh, how we have, uh, you know, marked all the locations in the four lakes, Hussein Sagar. Ground control point sampling locations SP1 means northwest corner near to Jalvehar. Jalvehar is uh, uh, in the direction northwest direction. It is a very very prominent uh, landmark, uh, very surrounding to Hussein uh, Sagar Lake. And like that, you have each and every location. For example, in Miralam Lake, we have the SP2. SP2 means south side opposite to Hassan Nagar. There is an Hassan Nagar south side opposite to Hassan Nagar. SP3 sampling location is southwest towards Rajasthan Bhavan, SVP. And SV, that, these are all the landmarks. So based on the landmarks, based on the latitude and latitude, based on our common sense, it is also very important. The accessibility of the, if you have more access to that area, you can have more grip on that area. So the accessibility is also very important. The knowing that area is also very important the uh, latitude and attitude and the longitude uh, uh, and the directions of each and every uh, sampling stations. Uh, based on that, we have collected all these uh, number of samples and analyzed it in our lab. How the research, you know, is, uh, uh, process, is proceeding, you can have a, uh, it's, you can see this. So what are the parameters that we analyze? Generally, and I, I am very, very specific in uh, selecting the water quality parameters and as per Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, there is a uh, national ambient quality standards and those standards and again, as well as the parameters, the selected parameters are there in the list given by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Based on the that list, we selected 12 parameters and all these parameters are analyzed. You can see how the parameters are classified. There are 12 parameters. One, uh, they classified as physical parameters, temperature, pH, transparency, the water transparency, turbidity levels, total solid, uh, total suspended solids, total dissolved solids, and, and, and bio-oxygen demand. And the chemical pollutants are organic compounds, and you can see NO3, the dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, like that. Of course, we have the biological parameters, microbial parameters, E. coli and coliform. These are the, some of the parameters what we have uh, selected for our study based on number one, Minister of Environment, uh, Forests and Climate Change reference. Number two, the facilities that are available in our laboratory. Number three, the 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 uh, skill set, the expertise that is available in the department. We have. Uh, selected. See, because this is a research oriented project and there should not be any bias thing. That is why we are very, very specific at each and every step. Now, you can see this table, you, you have the methods as per the American uh, uh, American physical and health, uh, health standards are there. And in this, uh, the units, Method of NR, all methods are also given in this table and all 12 parameters, how we have analyzed, how the method of, what is the method of analysis, what are the digit desirable limits and then permissible limits. And based on this, we have uh, assessed, we have analyzed, we have, uh, you know, uh, assessed the, all the parameters, whether they are within the limits or not. Now, these are some of the equipment that what we use and all these, almost all these equipment are available in my lab. 
in this lab and we have handheld spectro radiometer which we purchased the very latest one and uh, and almost all my environment students use it to use this uh, equipment for their research purpose uh, and again the data collection in the lake shamir pet lake with field spectro radiometer and uh, here one lady is there that is she is hema sailaja who did her phd in the same area this is her uh, her, her output our research output now she is in a, she is working in some organization with a very good position and uh, this is uh, definitely i can appreciate at this at this time i would like to appreciate this uh, uh, this phd scholar who did very marvelous hell marvelous work uh, even it is very hard to say this is a very hard work right collecting the samples from going to the lakes and collecting the data and analyzing is very hard work and she has I, i gave two research junior research scholars to her then she did very good and marvelous work now this is also uh, again field data this is where usain sagar lake uh, she collected the uh, samples with the spectral radiometer remember spectral radiometer we can say it, it is very data can be correlated with hyperion on board satellite data collection in umda sagar lake with field spectral radiometer and she took four different lakes at, under different environmental conditions and collection process of the spectral signatures using uh, handheld spectral radiometer these are the spectral signatures after collecting the data and you see how the curves are looking like water for water bodies for any water body the water absorption bands you can see the curves which you have valleys number of valleys are there you know all those valleys are called as the water absorption bands and uh, the uh, using the spectral radiometer how the curves looks like and again you see these uh, these curves the total 280 samples of water and 1400 field based spectral measurements have been taken at the different places of the lakes under investigation from each lake the spectra is averaged to 12 5 5 6 out of total spectra collected per season per lake uh, respectively such that the respect representative spectra for water quality parameter are considered you see that is the Uh, the crux of this spectral signature how the spectral signatures at a different wavelengths uh, the reflectance how the reflectance is varying you can see this is basically from the spectral uh, spectral spectral radiometer now you see this uh, uh, how the windows window you know the, these are called as the atmospheric windows and we generally otherwise calls called as the spectral uh signature spectral patterns and here you can see hyperspectral wavelength region how it varies you can see the all these uh, uh, tonal variations you can have look now you you see this uh, how the usain sagar lake data can be visualized in the hyperion image in this hyperion image geographically the water bodies in the imagery lies in between this is the longitude and latitude and and the hyperion image looks like this uh, usain sagar lake here it is there and and the digital data she has analyzed the digital data in terms of different curves and and uh, she correlated all these things and the you see comparison between hyperion spectra and field spectra of water you see the difference the hyperion versus the uh, the spectra the field spectra of water again this is again field spectra of water in, in different lakes in the study area and there are four lakes and four uh, uh, curves are there you have the convex hull pitted over and on the spectrum it normalizes uh, uh, reflectance spectra the comparison this line and we are going to have the coefficient 
analysis. You see regression analysis of This is the regression analysis as uh, measured versus estimated values for the total suspended solids. And again, you have the uh, turbidity levels. How the turbidity levels are uh, correlated estimated versus the measured one, measured one for four lakes. This is the for the turbidity. This is for chlorophyll concentrations, and this is again for such a depth. Uh, you know. In determination of the turbidity, the such a depth disks and all those things can be used. And by using that also, how the regression analysis looks like, you see, uh, the error analysis also can done. The coefficient of determinations are given in each and every uh, graph, which is the self-explanatory. And one is the 0 0.8 uh, for uh, uh, Shamir Pet Lake for Hussein Sagar Lake that is also 0 0.82 and the Miralam tank that is 0 0.74 the relation is 0 0.72 correlation coefficient for uh, Umda Sagar Lake. This is again uh, estimated values for you know uh, different concentrations you can have. Now you see in this uh, models you we developed some models in this. You can have turbidity, TSS, TP model like that. These are some of the models what we statistical. And after that, the models were validated by using again some uh, known data. And these are the models. And again, you can see the coefficients in the determination, coefficient of determination. And finally, I want to, uh, the crux of this is I want to tell you how the, the, the quality variations within the lake, uh, how it vary from one point to the other point uh, can be mapped using GIS, uh, RGIS uh, module, RGIS software is there. By using RGIS, all the data can be converted into spatial distribution maps and turbidity concentration of Hussein Sagar Lake during pre and post monsoon seasons of the study area from 2010 to 2014. So how, how the turbidity varies within this Sagar Lake. So this is very much useful for water quality monitoring by any decision making process. Nowadays in the in Telangana uh, State Pollution Control Board, they are using the remote sensing and GIS uh, for like anything for monitoring the quality parameters in and around Hyderabad city. So this is again a total phosphate concentration in Shamir Pet Lake. Uh, this is our uh, my students are. Uh, having a very high level skills in developing the spatial distribution maps from collecting the point data, how they can convert it into spatial variation maps by using RDIS software. Again, chlorophyll concentration in Miralam tank, uh, total suspended solids concentration in Umda Sagar Lake. So like that, you have uh, some of the spatial distribution maps. And in addition to that, we did water quality index also. Anyhow, we have the very good uh, data and we did some water quality index so that this can be used by the decision maker within Hyderabad city, at least for these four, four lakes. That is why we collect, we measured the water quality index by using the, the by using a reference. Mishra, I think, uh, Brown and others, they have developed this uh, uh, water quality index methodology. Uh, by using that, we find out the for all uh, uh, lakes for Usman, Usman Sagar, Hussein Sagar Lake. This is the water quality index calculations. So finally, the water quality index is 29.53. That means the rating is very bad. Hussein Sagar water is obviously very bad. That is also evident by this study. And again, uh, we have. Uh, like that water quality index and you see the water quality index of Hussein Sagar Lake uh, at the sampling locations during the study period and all the quad 
at each point, we find out the quality index for by considering all the parameters, and these are all all in very 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 bad condition. So regression between uh, mean estimated values from signatures and mean measured in situ values uh, at different points. This is the uh, you see the coefficient of uh, determination is 0 0.83.51. And again, for this is uh, 0 0.83. So these are the models we developed in our lab. So some of the findings uh, in our uh, study, uh, this is general, uh, you know, uh, for any researcher uh, out of the research work, they should have some finding. Well, the Hyperion high spectral resolution is responsible for producing a signal related with parameter concentrations, its applicability to smaller surface water systems may not result to be the best alternative due to its lower spatial resolution. This is again very important point. So it depends on if I say remote sensing data, you should always you know measure it. You should always judge based on the spatial resolution. That's what this point says. The analysis of end member extraction from the hyperspectral image. It is based on the assumption that the extracted pure pixels are truly representative of single homogeneous material. In real life situation, this might be seldom valid, hence accuracy is in abundance. Estimate of quality will depend how closely this assumption is satisfied in actual situations. You see, this is again, again, by experience only, you should always say whether your work is more authentic or not. And, and and if you are able to identify the pure fi pixels with respect to the homogeneous material, that pixel, the identification of the accuracy of the identification of that pixel ultimately indicates the, the quality or accuracy of your water quality. This is what it says. These are all very, very important points for any researcher. The Hyperion's low signal to noise ratio in several spectral bands produces negative reflectance values in the blue region of the spectrum and infrared regions. After evaluating the different band ratios for different parameters, the best results are obtained with 0.80% uh, accuracy from the model developed. Spectral characterization of the quality parameters through radiometric survey and laboratory analysis of the water samples from our different lakes are present and understand the water quality scenarios. This is uh, general uh, findings these uh, these are also some of the uh, again we need some future research should use hyperspectral remote sensing for the monitoring of other water pollutants such as volatile organic chemicals heavy metals contaminants of bacterial origin where few studies have been conducted laboratory study of the water samples with varied concentration will lead to establishment of the spectral signature into the spectral library with an inverse indices. So these are uh, some of the uh, very important points which anyone can attempt, any attempt can be made uh, to continue this type of research. Remember, the research should always concentrate the, for the, the establishment of the spectral signature, hyperspectral signature library. If you establish, if you establish that library for the future research, definitely this type of research will, will be useful for any environmental related applications. So with this, I'm very thankful for the patient hearing and thank you, thank you very much. If you have any doubts, you please ask me. So thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to know from the audience, from the, is there any questions? So there's one question. Please. Uh, so what is the cost of spectro radiometer? Also, the concentration of major capsules have been manually calculated. Are AAS or other instruments? Yeah, yeah it's a, the spectral radiometer's cost. Uh, uh, it varies from five lakhs to fifty lakhs also. Because. <laughs> That depends upon the uh, wavelength regions. How many bands are there like that? It varies. And for our university purpose, for our research purpose, 
I think uh, if you are able to spend up to 15 lakhs, I think you can get very good one. Definitely. That is number one. Number two, what is the next question, sir? Sir, in the, also the concentration of major captions uh, have been manually calculated are AAS or other instruments. Yeah, major, atomic, absorption. Uh, atomic absorption spectrometer. Yeah, definitely. The accuracy of uh, AAS is uh, as per my narrative because I am not expert in analyzing the uh, parameter. But, uh, hello. My 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 other environmental chemistry team is there in my department, so they 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 use that instrument, and uh, I I don't know much about that, but I, I AAS gives the more uh, very accurate. Uh, uh, results definitely I can say that okay so there's one more question from uh, uh, Mr. Raghul uh, yeah. thank you for your wonderful session I like to ask few questions sir other than hypo uh, hyperion data which hmm. hyperspectral data can be used to monitor water quality yeah yeah, yeah that uh, yeah, yeah, that, uh AVRS, some, some satellites are there, sir. I immediately I can't tell. I will give the list if you want. I will definitely share to Roshan. He can, he, he can immediately forward to you. Directly, I don't have immediate answer to that. <coughs> number of satellites are there. Number of sensors are there. And uh, uh, sensors, you know, each and every country is concentrating on hyperspectral remote sensing nowadays. Almost. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions from the participants? And anyone can interact with me by taking my email ID uh, from Roshan. No problem. Absolutely. So no we problem. have uh, actually we have shared the email ID. Uh, in the browser itself, all the presenters. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I have know. A small, yeah. Uh, a small question. Yeah. Uh, if suppose a young researcher or a uh, mm. scholar. Yeah. So where do you think we should focus now in next five years? What areas do you think are more important in terms of hyperspectral? Uh, so, where do you think we should look into now? Sir, sir, number one, number one, they should always think about the 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 water quality parameters for which or she should develop the spectral signature, hyperspectral signature. Okay, yes, you got my point. That is very very important now for for electromagnetic remote sensing. Number of spectral reflections curves are there. Absolutely, there is no problem in that. For hyperspectral signatures, at least for water quality parameter, number of water quality parameters are there. As per uh, American standards or as per Indian our ministry standards or our CPCP guideline standards, number of parameters are there, you know. If we are able to develop the spectral hyperspectral signature for each and every parameter, Nothing like that, sir. Nothing okay. like that. Tomorrow, tomorrow, definitely you are going to reduce the cost of monitoring of all the parameters by any industry. So the, okay. See, because today there is a rule in the government of India, each and every industry which, which you know, uh, releases the pollutants, water quality or water uh, pollutants, they have to they have to give the every day, day, day to day water quality parameters to the concerned regulatory body. They have to send. So instead, if we have the spectral signature for each and every parameter, if we are able to monitor on a real time basis, that real time basis means what? We have number of satellites revolving around the earth, right? So they, they, there are number of hyperspectral sensors are also there. If we are able to evolve any method of monitoring each and every parameters, 
in terms of the spectral signatures on, on a regular basis nothing like that you know got my point sir you yes, did not sir. collect the sample also by by understanding the signature itself yes you are releasing too much uh, water pollutants in, from your industry like that you can a regulator uh, authority can say that yes sir yes sir uh, yeah this is uh, actually that is my dream actually i did, i completed 33 years of experience uh, i did my mtech in remote sensing and i my project itself is water quality my mtech project and my phd project is water quality monitoring or mapping or you know water quality distribution map like that that is my dream yes that sir. is nothing like that you the, what is that you should always develop a methodology which should be used for real time water quality monitoring okay real time monitor that means you sit in your lab if you see the signature the satellite signal that is coming at an altitude to your computer by seeing that signal itself if you are able to tell the water quality yes this is water quality parameter and the the signature is like this the, the this type this water quality is exceeding the limits if you are able to tell that nothing like that you know i think day is, to, day is going to come in on that using hyperspectral signatures oh great because, yeah i am telling there is a scope there 100% there is a scope for hyperspectral bands only for each each small very very narrow narrow range of wavelength region if you are able to tell the concentration of uh, let us say total suspended solids concentration then automatically you are converting your analog that is a, a signal into a numerical number right yes, sir. So, so you compare with that numerical number with the limits obviously your job is completed so i think the day is going to come whether we are going to see or not i don't know but the day is going to come definitely i can tell Okay, sir, sure, sir. Of signature is like that. You got it. So thank yeah. you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting to come here and then give uh, the expert lecture. I think I've been grateful because you are readily accepted to give a presentation over here. Uh, we'll be definitely in touch with you. I think all the attendees also would like to be in touch with you. A lot of things learned from uh this lecture as well as in future so thank you sir thanks a lot thank you roshan thank you thank you to all thank you sir yes okay. so can you end your presentation please yeah i am going to end on the Is it okay? Shall I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shall I come out? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are going to have a, a last session valedictory. If you yeah, okay. have time, you can be here. Or... No, sir. No, I have some other work. Then. <laughs> okay, sir. No problems. Okay, I will. Yes, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, hello, ma'am. You, ma'am, you joining? Okay, uh, thank you all the people.
participants. What we are going to do is we are going to have a quick valedictory session now. Uh, within uh, maybe in five minutes, we'll start the valedictory session. Before that, we have just shared you the uh, feedback form. We post it on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share it in Q&A, the feedback form. I request all the participants here to just quickly fill in the feedback form. We'll also be mailing you, but uh, we thought like if we can give the feedback in the next five minutes, it will be very helpful to us. Um, and also what we are going to do is we are going to, unless you fill the feedback form, we are not going to send you the participation certificate. So this is the only condition I have here. So please make sure that you fill the uh, feedback form. And as soon as you fill the feedback form, we'll be sending you the uh, certification, participation certification. So we'll just wait for a couple of minutes and then quickly a valedictory note and then close it. Thanks. Ma'am, are you able to hear me? I can hear. Okay, ma'am, I think uh, then uh, we can give a couple of minutes to participants to fill the feedback form. Maybe 16, 10, we can uh, start our valedictory. Okay, fine. Two minutes, ma'am. Yes, okay, fine. Okay. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you.
Ma'am, I think we can start, ma'am. Okay, fine. Chief Coordinator, Dr. Roshan Srivastav, Director, IIT Tirupati, Navavishkar Innovation Hub Foundation, and the team, key speakers, the coordinators of the workshop, participants from academia and research, colleagues and friends, good evening to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this small valedictory function. We have come to the end of the two days workshop on hyperspectral remote sensing and its applications certain that all the participants got benefited. Hope it will find application in your research, work and professional career. This workshop aimed to create awareness about hyperspectral remote sensing, hyperspectral data processing and its applications, etc. This workshop covered an overview of hyperspectral remote sensing, the platforms, data processing techniques, and its various applications. This workshop targeted the young minds to excel in hyperspectral remote sensing and its various applications. Hope the workshop served the purpose. We had eminent speakers from reputed institutions from India and abroad with vast experience in their field, namely, we had uh, Dr. Rabi Narayan Sahu from Indian Agriculture Research Institute for the first day. Professor Leniv, Earth Observation Satellite Image Applications Lab, Italy. Then we had Professor M. Anji Radif, Director, Research and Development, JNTU, Hyderabad. Mr. Vinay Kumar, scientist from Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, ISRO, Dehradun. Ms. Asfa Siddiqui, scientist, Urban and Regional Studies, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, Hyderabad. Daradun, then Dr. Vinay Vaibhav Garg, scientist, water resource department, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, ISR of Daradun, and Mr. Justin George, scientist, agriculture and soil department, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing. They were all eminent speakers. So we hope you all got uh, benefited from all these lectures. We had around 60 participants faculty members, research scholars, and students from academic institutions, and few of the participants from abroad also. The application of hyperspectral remote sensing is vast. There is a lot of research possibilities. As uh, Sir was sharing, the very important aspect is uh, spectral signatures. Actually, we can develop a library of various spectral signatures there is a vast scope in the future. It will drastically reduce the cost of data retrieving data collection because uh, water quality data parameters, uh, so many are there. So if any of you can, if few of you can work on such aspects, it will be a great support to our nation. So the application of remote sensing is vast. There is a lot of research possibilities as you understood. Hope the lectures enlightened and ignited the young minds and gave them the confidence to think beyond. We are extremely delighted for the two days workshop, which was a great success for all those who attended fully. We are grateful to Dr. Roshan Srivastav, IIT Tirupati and the team uh, for making it possible to organize this workshop. I also acknowledge the Navavishkar Hub team for all the support given for the successful completion of this workshop. So now over to Dr. Roshan. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, so what we'll do is now, I, I think uh, personally, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the uh, experts who have joined this uh, session. You've been very kind to have listening to them. Uh, giving wonderful lectures. I think as ma'am has said, very fruitful. I hope all the attendees might have actually gained a lot. I have gained personally a lot, although I might have missed some of the lectures. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank Mary Kuti ma'am because right from day one, probably we might have delayed the process a bit. Uh, uh, but uh, thank you ma'am for your patience and you have been there always to make thank sure that 
program is uh, there successful and i would like to thank my team uh, gomati prashanti shailaja our ceo and uh, of course the director ait tirupati and our other faculty members who have been very supportive for this workshop thank you everyone i hope we'll see you again uh, on a next version of hyperspectral workshop will more on the hands on in person workshop and uh, please keep following our website keep following our media pages uh, as soon as we get some information we will share it with you uh, and we are also put you up in our mailing uh, list so anything comes up most probably you'll be receiving the mails for each uh, workshop events and other things so thank you thank you so much uh, for making this program successful thank you thank you one and all yeah thank you so much yeah thank you so i think prashanti we can end the meeting yeah.